Hi, thank you so much for watching or maybe just listening to our BIP 100 podcast. This is our BIP chat and BIP stands for business is personal. And Thomas and I really believe it is. And I hope you do too. It's really the juxtaposition of when somebody says to you, hey, Penny, it's not personal, it's just business. And then you just know that life is not going to be particularly pleasant. And we're in a world where emotional intelligence is becoming such a huge differentiator and treating yourself and others in a way that reflects that you believe in the philosophy of business is personal is really important to us. And it hopefully is to you. And we've created a community called BIP 100. It's called 100 because we've created a community of no more than 100 business experts. These are people who have dedicated a lot of their life to their expertise. And it's really exciting now because we've got this community to the point where we've now got people coming to us and asking, well, you've got this great community of experts. Can you introduce me to one of them for X, Y, Z skills? And so by bringing this podcast, it gives us an opportunity to help you find great people. And today we are talking to Nick Cramp. And Nick has a business called Better Before Bigger. And Nick is a business expert. And he is applying his expertise by working with a particular type of company size or individuals with particular needs and a particular mindset about how they want to go into their future. So I'm going to introduce you to Nick um, and we'll go and delve a little bit more into um, why we have definitely observed and experienced and know that uh, Nick is a fantastic business expert who you can work with through various ways, whether you want to have one to one coaching group sessions so that you really have that peer-to-peer -peer experience um, and other ways. So listen in because there's going to be some really powerful information here about how important it is to make your business better before bigger. And I think I really resonate with that, Nick. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation with you, Nick. So first of all, I want to Let's introduce you a little bit, get people to get a bit of context, because I explained that you are a business expert and um, I want to give a little bit of context why I say that. So you've had a lot of experience. Do you want, can you just run through that just to give us a, an idea of why business is so special to you? Sure. So I think my expertise comes from three things. First of all, I had 16 years running small businesses. So I ran my own businesses, a health club and a preschool and nursery. So I learned firsthand what it was like to be an entrepreneur and a business owner and that roller coaster journey that is that that life. And that was the first 15 years of my adult life. So I was fortunate to be able to buy a business when I was quite young and learned quite a lot of things not to do fairly early on in life. Yeah. I then realized at some point that what I loved was the business of business and working on business rather than in business. Yeah. I enjoyed my business, but I'm never in love with them. They were something I did, but it wasn't the same passion that I feel for what I'm doing now. So I did an MBA and learned a lot about the mechanics of businesses and filled in my knowledge gap. Mm -hmm. around some of the theory and practices in other, other businesses. And then from that, I evolved into coaching and business guidance. So I realized that there was a lot of business owners out there that were like me. Mm -hmm. They were busy inside their business running a business, but actually the business was running them. Yeah. Weren't really working on their business. It was a treadmill. And it was continual operational treadmill, um, which we have some successes with, but the successes aren't sustainable because there's too much stuff and we haven't set the business up correctly. Yeah, yeah. So I went and did some coaching, trained with Emith in America and learned how to be a coach. And then since then, I've developed my own coaching program, which we'll dive into, yeah. Which means I've worked with a lot of businesses, different industries, different sectors, different stages. So I feel I've got 30 years plus experience of inside and on businesses, which I can bring now to my clients and to the wider community. Yeah, it's wonderful. And and when I said um that, you know, I had observed and experienced you. So within BIP 100, one of our 
big principles is um, contribution. And that's what makes a community so powerful. And I've been going through this wonderful experience with you where you are contributing some support and coaching to help people have a better business in 2024. And there are three key questions that we have asked our, our members yeah. um, in order to get them to really focus in on, on how they're going to feel about 2024. So I want to repeat these here because anybody listening in, I think you should take these in and think about this. So as we head now into the next year, and maybe you'll listen to this in five years and you'll be thinking about the next year, uh, we're talking about 2024 here. The first one is, would you like a better business in 2024 rather than necessarily a bigger business? The second one would, would you like a business that works for you rather than one that you work for? Love that. And do you have ambitions that exceed your current capacity and capability? These are absolutely brilliant questions, Nick. Um, where you know when you brought these together, this this you know sounds simple, don't they? These three questions, yeah. but I know how hard it is to distill and get people to focus and distill yourself without having somebody like yourself helping. Can you just give us a little bit more insight into why those three questions are so important for the better, yeah. bigger? I, I think that there becomes a time in every business and maybe more than once where focusing on growth is the wrong thing to do. Yeah. I think businesses can outgrow their capacity and capability and that puts too much pressure on the system or the people and that leads to overwhelm, it leads to unhappy staff, it leads to unhappy customers and it's counterproductive to grow too quickly. I think some businesses have what I call the success trap where they've been very successful, but they've all been too successful for the size of structure and process they've got. And what I encourage is what's called a plateau period. Mm. So like when you're climbing a mountain, you can't climb for five hours. What you can do is climb for two hours and then go across a plateau, recover and then climb again. Mm. And I think for a lot of businesses, that's what they need is plateau periods where rather than focusing on growth, yeah. they focus on better. How can we better serve our existing clients? I think most businesses are leaving money on the table yeah, because they're busy trying to find new clients and new customers, and they haven't totally serviced the needs of the existing client base yeah. because they have this growth mentality. Yeah, and it's interesting. So I suppose I've been in the business world for 40 years, and yeah. 25 years ago is when we all started to really see the impact of the internet yeah and that book that i remember everybody loved called the tipping point yeah. and it was all about you know you get here and then your business is going to fly and i think it has created a huge panic in business yeah. owners of if i don't do it now it's never going to happen yeah do, do, do you relate to that because i i never been there myself and, and I think what happens, Penny, is that you chase the vanity metrics, yeah. turnover, headcount. These are vanity metrics which don't necessarily serve the owner. Yeah. Net profitability, amount of dividends you're taking out of the business is a sanity metric. Yeah. That's what's going to enable you to sleep at night. That's what's going to enable you to kind of build a better business. And I think that we get caught up in the vanity metrics and that's part of the problem. So my challenge to business owners is, you know, you get to decide here, guys and girls, do you actually want a better a better business or a bigger business? Because I think if you ask your staff, they would probably vote for a better business. Yeah, yeah. And I think if you asked your customers and clients, they would definitely vote for a better business. So who are you building this bigger business for? Yeah. Who's it going to serve? And are you sure about that? Yeah, I, I do you know it's interesting. I mean, I wish I'd met you a number of years ago, um, because I love this this approach. I really love it. It's sort of very calming. And when I look at Thomas's and my journey in '98, creating Academy, and it became yeah. very, you know, it was word of mouth, so it grew, grew and grew. Yeah. And in terms of capacity and capability, we were constantly for 14 years under stress with that. Um, and, you know, what, what I find really interesting is when I reflect, and I don't know what you think about these two different um, definitions, but when I reflect on me as a business person, 
Yeah. Um, I was worked employed for some time and, and accrued some great skills from that. Then I became what everybody called an entrepreneur. Yeah. Now I love calling myself a small business. Yes. And now I've got quite a def- sort of purist view of what is an entrepreneur, what is a small business, because I think the term entrepreneur can put a huge pressure on people. And, yeah. and so I just wondered what you, before I give my opinion on that, I wonder what you yeah. thought about that. I, I, I think entrepreneur is almost a mindset rather than anything else. And I think small business is always inferred that you need to become a medium business and you need to become a big business. But I think having the wisdom, and I love the fact, one of the things that attracted me to BIP was not BIP, but it was the 100 afterwards. Yes. It was the fact that it was going to be a certain size community, which meant I can get to know people and get value because there's not too many people. Yeah. You know, yeah. there's enough people the business which yeah. coaches would say that's madness but actually yeah. it, it, this is really um reflecting on what you're saying which is yeah. just make it better and better now yeah so how can you drive retention rate exactly. how can you offer more value to the existing people yeah. Yeah. you know how can they refer people in so you've got a waiting list so you haven't got to do any other marketing because you're so damn good you're like that italian restaurant in town that just has a waiting list and doesn't need to advertise because the quality of experience is so good yeah i like that actually that is a good comparison because you know a restaurant has a a limited amount of covers that they can do so now i think it's um really powerful and also the other thing i feel is we spent probably 20 years of our life maybe from 30 to 50 in that entrepreneurial mindset, yeah. building the asset, not actually thinking about our income. Because yes. that manana, manana, it's going to come. We're yeah. going to get payback. Um, and that's something else that I find really interesting when, I, when um, I'm talking to you is that you talk about income, your reward. What's your reward as yeah. a business owner? And are you having balance, et cetera? Well, I think if you look at the stats, the amount of businesses that actually get sold is so minimal. So for people to put off taking reward now for this deferred potential income at some point in the future, for most businesses, that is not going to happen. That's fact. There isn't this kind of ready market for people wanting to buy your semi-profitable, semi-automated, slightly ill-defined business. It doesn't work like that. And if you have created a business which is sellable, then you are in the minority. For most people, I want them to enjoy today. I want them to enjoy this month. You know, most of my business owners have family, young family that's growing up. They shouldn't choose between working weekends or spending time with the kids. But that's their reality. And I understand that when you're in startup mode, but three or four years in, if you're still working weekends, if you're still taking your laptop on the beach, pretending you're on holiday, you've got something wrong. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, probably a lot of people can resonate with this, what you're saying. And when I think about, and I'm just using us as a case study here, Hmm. when Thomas and I were working excessive hours and exhausting ourselves and burning out, um, we had, you know, a lot more staff, a lot more costs, often didn't take our income. Now, A, a, a nice little business with seven people in the team yeah and we have a healthy income um, yeah. so it is really interesting and I don't know I sometimes wonder you know when you're working with business owners do you find that they've just found that they were on a nice gentle conveyor belt like in a like in an airport nice yeah. gentle, and then they suddenly find that they've switched over to this roller coaster and they didn't even realize they were going to do it and they don't know how to get back Yeah, because I think that's often the case, isn't it? That sometimes you're too successful for your own good and you don't learn how to say no to clients. You don't learn how to qualify clients. So any opportunity seems like a good opportunity. When I first started business coaching, at one point, I think I had about 17 clients, all different shapes and sizes. And I just felt I could coach everybody. You know, whatever the problem was, whatever the stage of the business. Yeah, I was the answer to that solution, that problem. But the reality was I wasn't. And the reality was I wasn't serving any of those clients particularly well. And I think that 
as we get older, hopefully we learn that qualifying, and I know you're very big on this in BIP, you know, taking the time to make sure that the people are a good fit for you, yeah. making sure they're ones that are going to be around for a while so yeah. that they do get good customer lifetime value, you know, and taking your time about who you're working with rather than this, oh, it's a new client, so great. It's another customer, great. That mentality just means that you're out of control of your business. Yeah. I think that's the bit that we get wrong. Gosh, and I mean, the number of people that will feel that way, that that out of control. I remember somebody saying to me, it was in the business context, actually, that when it was actually not Academy, it was another business I created, Digital Youth Academy. And he said to me, the operations director that worked for me said, you don't seem as bright and cheerful as you used to be. And I said, well, I don't feel I have as much control anymore over this business. I had investors that were really very challenging and, you know, in control of my vision. And also, you know, we're just grabbing clients to feed the business and everything. And he said that he had watched a documentary on happiness. And he said there were three things that made up happiness. One was um, your constitution. 50% was your constitution, your attitude. Okay. Do, you, do you wake up trying to be a happy person or do you love being miserable? Yeah. 10% was the achievement of the things you want. 40% yeah. was how much control you feel you have over your life. Yeah. And I think that that was quite, a, I mean, at that point, actually, I think yeah. it was like a week later, I put the business up for sale because I knew yeah. that I was never going to get the control back. And um, so, yeah, that control. So when you're working with your clients, you know, whether you're working one-to-one -one with a, a small business in your group sessions or whether you're working one-to-one, yeah. -one, working across the managers and the leaders, yeah control subject quite a key thing it, it really is because the business has got to live within their life rather than their life living within the constraints of the business yeah and for people that's the important thing that we've got to help them create roles that are doable yeah you know, we've got to be able to win this week we've, yeah. we've got to end the week with a tick in the box that we've had a good week and a lot of time we create a business which is just difficult to do that with yeah. because we're trying too hard to put too much stuff, too many clients, too many customers, too many orders through the system and the system's not built for that. Yeah. So by having this plateau period where you look at all the bits of the business and you say, right, well, you know, the processes we put in place when we started up probably aren't any longer suitable for what we are as a business now. So what, what do we need to upgrade? Is it the software? Is it the processors? You know, Maggie that started as our bookkeeper is now de facto financial controller, but she's not trained as a financial controller. She just is a very willing, lovely lady that just keeps saying yes. Oh, yeah. But it's not helping her and helping us because she's not going to do that role. Yeah. So there comes a point where I think we need to stand back from our business and saying, well, you know, is what we've got future fit? Yeah, yeah. Will it work for this next period? Yeah, very. It almost seems so obvious that we should do this. But like you say, we want to climb that mountain in one day and not go off yeah. on those plateaus. So we've talked about, um, we've sort of given reference to the type of clients that are your, the people that you know you can have the greatest impact yeah. on. And I want to start with the first one, which is uh, companies that, you know, they've got some, They've grown, the founders grown it. They've got some managers yeah. in place. Those some of those managers have become leaders. They've got a man. Tell me sort of how you would go in and work with a company like that, just so we can take away some of the mystery sure. if you're interested. I, I always start my working relationships one-on-one -on -one with the MD, CEO, or founder, because I feel that our relationship is key and I need to understand their motivation. I need to understand their fears. Yeah. I need to understand what they really want to do in the future. I think some of us take on an MD role, which we're not suited for, yeah. but we feel that's the logical thing to do. So part of my work with them is helping them discover their future role. And that's the starting point of working on this is what does this next vision look like? Oh. Um, so it's really a reframing exercise to say, well, congratulations, you've got this far. Where do we go next? Let's be very conscious about what we're going to do next. Yeah. If you want to get bigger, why? Yeah. How's it going to serve you? Have you got the capacity to do that? Have you got the finances? You know, is that an option really? Yeah. Going better. 
serve you better right now? Would yeah. that be better for you personally? How is your personal life? How are the family coping with this? So we bring a lot of that stuff into the equation to make sure that the next phase of the business is going to work for them. Lovely. Once we've done that reframing, then we get together with the senior people in the team, the leaders and other people, and we do the rethink exercise. Right. That is based on the phrase, what got you here might not get you there. Right. Lovely. So just because we've done that so far until this point, yeah. it doesn't mean to say it's the best option going forward. So why don't we review all the options? And if we stay with the status quo, great. But we're staying with it consciously after reviewing those options. We're not staying with it because we're too lazy to change. Yeah, yeah. So the rethink is where we co-design what the next stage of the business needs to look like and where we need to get better. How exciting. They must love that. That must be very cathartic. The, the leadership team and those senior people love the fact that we can spend time away from the business because I normally do the off-sites in nice locations where we can get away from the screens and we can just talk through what we've actually got. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Okay. Most businesses say that... Sorry, I just wanted to say as well on that, mm. because I'm very aware that you are a, a generous ref referrer in terms of, you know, once they start to... You're such a good networker that you once they start to need other skills, you're very good yeah. at finding the people that you know and helping them to embed other experts into this equation, aren't you? Yeah, I, I've I've realised, taken a while, but I've realised that I'm a generalist and a specialist generalist because I work with a certain sector, yes. a certain stage, but I'm a generalist. Yeah, I know a little bit about a lot. Yeah, What the business needs in certain areas is a specialist. Yes. So I've got a range of associates that I work with that I refer in mm -hmm. if the business, for instance, needs to upgrade their financial function. Mm -hmm then I've got people that I can refer in to help them do that. Yes. If it's more of a digital technical problem upgrade needed, then I've got people. So I help the businesses choose the people to work with that will help them grow to the next stage yes. by putting in these better systems. And I, I love that part of the role. I love the fact that I can work with others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, and it's really, you know, as we've talked about, Penny, you get to the stage in life where you realise what you're good at and what you're not good at and you stay in that swim lane and that gives you enjoyment. Yeah, but also, as I said at the start of the show, it can be really hard to find the right suppliers. And so if you've already yes. found people that you know how to work with, they understand your model, it's really powerful. So we've done the reframe and the rethink. Yeah. And then the third one is? The third one is refocus, which is where it actually happens within the company. Once I've empowered the manager, sorry, the leaders and the MD, then it's about them driving the changes through the organization. Yeah. So we work through each month a different element of the business, which we're trying to upgrade, if you like. Mm -hmm. I support them with materials and templates and various things they can use to do that. So we give ourselves a period where we look to get the business better. Yeah. So that this future growth is then an option because we've built more capacity, yeah. we've built the skill set, we've improved the mindset. So all of those elements that are under pressure right now, we're looking to improve. Yeah, so and the other thing I like about this is it's a bit like, you know, when I went to see a psychologist in 2018, I thought, well, you know, am I going to be with her for life? Is she just going to hold on to me yeah. because she found a client? But I really like your model because... You know, it's very intense at the beginning, a lot of your time, a lot of their time. And then over time, you they become independent and they may just check yeah. in with you sometimes. Yeah. So I'm aware that you, you know, at this stage of the year um, and you've capped, you know, that you want 12 businesses. And that's yeah. what we're doing at the, you know, you're doing at the moment is you're, you're assessing which ones you can support. And I do yeah. want to mention that just in case there's anybody out there who thinks, well, is Nick already at capacity? Because got a fantastic thriving business but this is this where he can you know move people out and bring people in which is really yeah. fantastic so let's just as we're sort of finishing up here um a very important part is the people who haven't yet got to the stage of those companies the small yeah. business person who maybe you know maybe they're on their own maybe they've got a little associate yeah. team around them how do you help them how can you help them 
Well, interestingly, Penny, it's exactly the same material, yeah. but it's just applied in a different way. Because if we're working for ourselves, we might not have a team of employed people, but we have a team of associates and freelancers we work with. Yeah. So all of the applications that we apply to the bigger businesses, we yeah. can apply to solopreneurs or smaller business because it is this mindset shift. Yeah. You know, there is some... I. I love working with small businesses as, as my suppliers yes. because I know that I will get better attention, better service, quicker response times. There's something lovely about a small business. I like to go to restaurants that have got three items on the menu. Yeah. I know the chef is using fresh ingredients and cooking stuff they love. Yeah. If there's more than two pages on a menu, then I walk out the restaurant literally because I'm just thinking, you know, you're not a specialist. You're just trying to please so many people. So that's for I you that... like that because you live in a very nice gastro area. So you do. <laughs> and, and I think that's the thing. It's the confidence to stay small and stay in your swim lane and say, this is what I'm great at. And the program for the, the entrepreneurs and the kind of smaller businesses focuses on that and says, right. Don't worry about the vanity metric. The vanity metric will take care of itself. If you have a great product, you will have a waiting list. You will have people wanting to work with you. But don't focus on that. Absolutely. Focus on being better and serving your existing clients. If I delight my existing clients, guess what? They're going to stay with me. They're going to refer me. And they're going to buy more of me. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And that makes life very simple. Yeah, it's very lovely. And... I suppose there's, there's a thing that these terms that people use, scarcity and abundance. Yeah. And I imagine the, you know, the very small business who's just starting out, who hasn't got the same issues as the bigger business. The bigger business has probably got a little bit more leeway on investments and, you know, and yeah. what they can do. The smaller business, I find that they're, they're the people that sort of sit in the scarcity place, fearful are spending yeah. money on themselves but they never therefore they never get out of the trap do they no and, and and that's the difficulty i think that as you say you've got to get some momentum rolling yeah yeah i mean i remember between businesses how i just knew i wanted to invest it was actually to invest in ha having a publisher and getting a, a book written and yeah. done and I, and then, you know, I I had to borrow you know go into a bank overdraft and negotiate it. but if i hadn't done that that 5,000 effectively I invested turned into four years later over those four years 750,000 yeah purely because I was able to just realize that unless I do this I'm yeah. never going to be able to do that and um, I, do, I, I like to share that because I think anybody listening some of them will be the, the the larger smaller business but those that are listening thinking this all sounds fantastic you have created a a product that they can join um which i really yeah. love which is a, more of a group coaching scenario yeah. um, there's a group coaching offering which works for yeah. those people you're it's, describing which is wonderful i think it's wonderful nick this has been a, a beautiful chat i really is and um I, I you probably can see in the background the book better before bigger have you got it on your desk by any chance it, yeah. just so happy to have a copy <laughs> It's on Amazon. It's on Kindle as well as um, print, isn't it? I, I believe. Yeah. And um, there's an audio version coming later this year. Oh, brilliant. Um, and if you've really enjoyed this, you know that you hopefully you've seen that Nick is a, a gentleman. He literally in the in the absolute way that a gentleman should be a gentle man and um, no hard selling. But if you just want to inquire, have a chat um, with Nick about where you are with your business. Um, yeah, get in touch with Nick, contact me and or Thomas and we'll in, uh, connect you or look for Nick Cramp, C-R-A-M-P dot com. Am I right? It is a dot com, isn't you it? Are. Yeah, it is. Uh, and you can see more about it um, or look up Nick on LinkedIn. So thanks for your time, Nick. I've really, really Hi. enjoyed it. And, you know, as we go into the next year, anybody that's listening to this, I hope you build a better business.